good stuff is. <clears throat> because you know, this is the part where it gets a little tricky to track down everything. The PD you know, NC thing is really the same kind of idea as what you did in the lab, just a little bit, you know, kind of more notes you know, to handle. But this is the part where, you know, it really is going to be a little bit harder. Okay, so I need to somehow connect register C to the A port. So what I do is I start with the A port here. I track it down to the multiplexer here. I know this select has to be a zero because otherwise it's going to be coming from the program counter, which is not what the RTL description is specifying. So I need it to be a zero. So I now track down this wire over here. It goes all the way back to this D multiplexer. So that means, you know, whatever R O zero D mux is going to be important. <clears throat> so what do you think this select bit needs to be? Okay, first of all, what is the bit width of R O one D mux? How many bits are we talking about here? Okay, I know you guys, some of you guys are squinting. <clears throat> so I'm going to magnify a little bit more so that you don't have to squint as much. So what we have done so far, okay, let me just kind of repeat. What, have, what we have done so far is to follow the input zero from this multiplexer, and it comes out of this demultiplexer here. The question is, what should I specify as the select of this demultiplexer? The first thing we need to determine is how many bits are we talking about? Is it one bit, two bits, or three bits? Hmm? It's only one because it only has two outputs, so you only need one one select bit to specify if the is it output zero or is it output one that we need. So which output are we going to select? We just went through that exercise, right? This goes all the way here, and it is coming out of output zero. Very good. Okay. So now we have just determined that RO0 D, well, RO1, okay, this is RO1 DMUX, <clears throat> need to be a zero, okay? So I go back to the question, okay? And then we look up RO1 DMUX, and that needs to be a zero. Then what do we do? Okay, we go like, okay, but that this wire needs to be connected to register C. How do I get that to happen? You go like, um, but it's coming out of the register bank. You know, I'm, we are running out of road here. No, we are not. Okay, because what we do is we zoom into the register bank in this case. So that's why we have another document for the register bank. <clears throat> I will bring it into view right now. <laughs> this is register output one. That needs to somehow connect to register C. How do we figure that out? Okay, in other words, we need this wire to somehow connect to this output port over here. What is between them? Okay, let me ask that question again. We're looking at the output of register C. We are looking at register output one. What is between here and here? A is a multiplexer, okay? This is the only way standing in between, okay? Which means we have to figure out um, how are we going to configure this multiplexer here? <clears throat> how many bits are, you know, is how many bits, how many bit or bits are needed, is needed or are needed in order to specify which input of the multiplexer connects to the output. And by the way, that is a trick question. Two, very good. How do we know? Yes. <laughs> and also, log two of four is also two. Okay, so you can figure out, figure it out either way. When this says it was x2, that means you have two bits. Okay, so that means, you know, oh, so that means if I bring this with you, with me to exam two, you know, some of those things are automatically figure out. I don't even have to understand why it's two bits because it is already spelled out, okay? Okay, so that answers one of the questions, which is how many bits? The second question is, <clears throat> um, 
how should I figure out figure out those values of the bit? Are they zero, 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 one, or what? Okay. So now you have to look up your register C, and then you follow the lines. Okay. Whoop. Right here, and it goes to here. Which input are we talking about? This is input zero, input one. This is input two. Right. Do not write two down as your answer. Okay. Let me go back to the answer sheet. <clears throat> oh, where is it? There we go. So do not, okay, once again, do not write down a two over here. This is not good. Why? Because the question specifically asks you to use binary numbers. Okay, so two is not a binary number. How do we know two is not a binary number? Because in base two, there is no digit called two. You only got zero and one. Okay, so that means, ah, okay, we cannot do this. Instead, you write down one zero, because one zero, as a binary number, is two. Okay, so we got that figure out. Um, cool. <clears throat> so that means, you know, register output one is not going to be used. So if it is not going to be used, do we need to do something about it? Okay, let's think about this a little bit here. So this is register output one enable. It connects to a demultiplexer. The demultiplexer does have a potential connection to the D port of RAM. Okay, so that is not safe. Okay, to turn on this particular demultiplexer. If you do turn on this demultiplexer, you have to make sure that it is not a two. Okay, the D, you know, the select is not a two. So I'm just going to turn it off. Okay. So back to the answer sheet, I'm just going to say uh, register output one enable is going to be a zero, which means it really does not matter which register is connected to register um, output zero. It also does not matter how I configure the demultiplexer because the entire demultiplexer is off anyway. Is that okay? All right. So we only got a few more to specify here. Um, are we updating the program counter in this case? Okay, let me go back to the description, the RTO description here. Are we updating the program counter? Is the program counter even mentioned in the description of what we are about to do? No, it's not on the right-hand side of the assignment. It's not on the left-hand side of the, assignment, of the assignment, which means, yeah, we are not going to update it at all. Okay, so that means the program counter enable it's going to be a zero. We are not updating the program counter. If we are not programming, we are not. Um, if we are not updating the program counter, does it matter what PC box box is going to specify? No. But the question is, how many bits are there in PC box box? Mm, that one is a little bit more tricky because there's no X3 that can help you. Because in the diagram, okay, I'm going to show you guys where to find a PC Mux Mux. So PC Mux Mux is right here. It is the select of this particular multiplexer. So, so, so this time, you cannot say, oh, it says X3, so there are three bits. You have to use the other way, which is to take the log 2 of the number of inputs of the multiplexer. This multiplexer has eight inputs. Count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Log two of eight is three. So there are three bits to this whole thing, and none of them matter. So that means, you know, when we go back to the answer sheet, we specify not care, not care, not care. All right, so we got most of it figured out. <clears throat> um, RI mux is the other one. Okay, this one does matter. So we go back to the diagram here. RI mux is this particular select bit here. So it does matter because, you know, there are two ways to update a register, um, you know, connection zero and connection one, and they connect to different things. If you specify connection one, okay, then you trace this wire, and it comes out of the ALU. We're not using the ALU. We're not doing any actual computation. So it has to be the other one. So that means RIMUX has to be a zero in this case, because input zero of RIMUX eventually connects to the D port 
of RAM, which is exactly what the RTL description is trying to say. Okay, the output of RAM is going to be used to update whatever register that we specified, which is register A in this case. So we switch back here, <clears throat> and then we specify A0 here, okay? So now we have only a few left, okay? One is the bit zero of ROM, okay? So we go here, <clears throat> and then we try to track down the, what is bit zero of ROM. Where is it going to? So this is bit zero of ROM, and we see that it goes into the enable of the instruction register. <clears throat> well, this part is a little bit tricky, because even though the RTI does not specify you know, to update, well, okay, I, I'm going to take, I take that back. We are not updating the instruction register because the RTL description does not say anything about updating the, the instruction register. So that means, you know, for the answer sheet, this has to be a zero. And we have two more bits to figure out and we are all done <clears throat> with this question. So what about bit 24 and bit 25? We go back to the diagram. And then we have to track now those two. This is bit 25. Bit 25 goes to the OR gate, and it goes into the input here, which is the clear of, reg of the, the, the microcode pointer. Are we ready to reset the microcode pointer to 000? No, we are not ready to do that. Not yet. So that means you know, that has to be a zero. Bit 25 has to be a zero, because otherwise, it's just going to reset you know, the micro code pointer back to 000 without accomplishing what we need to do. What about bit, what about bit 24? So we track down the second to the most significant bit, which is this wire. And this wire goes all the way to this multiplexer here, <clears throat> which, is, which at this point is not important because you know, what I'm asking is about the rising edge. But after the rising edge, there's a falling edge between the rising edge and the falling edge, this wire cannot change its state. So it is still important for us to specify it at this point of time. So the question is, <clears throat> when this is all done, what do I want to do with the microcode pointer? Do I want it to increment, or do, want, do I want to reload it from the instruction register? Okay, we are not, we're not fetching, okay? This instruction has nothing to do with it, fetching another opcode, so we should not be using uh, input zero for this multiplexer. So that means you know, the select has to be a one. So that means bit 24 of the D port of ROM needs to be a one. So we go back to the answer sheet and then we specify a one here. And that's how we answer question number two. So it really depends on your familiarity of the processor, the register bank, and in some occasions, the ALU. And we have talked about all three already in this class. So are there any questions concerning number two? Yep. Oh, I can, I can ask this question in a few different formats. I can give you this table, and then you tell me what it is going to do. I can just reverse the direction of the entire thing. Or I can give you the RTL description, I give you a faulty table with incorrect values, and your job is to fix it. But not every single field is wrong. You have to first figure out which one is wrong and then fix it with an explanation. So I can ask the same, I can ask about the same material in an in, in, in a variety of different you know, methods. So do not expect yours to be exactly like this. Yep. Huh? In this one, you, you do not need an explanation. I didn't, I'm just really looking at the numbers inside the table. So it depends on how the question is formulated. Because if the question said, this is not going to work, um, then you, have, you know, and I ask for an explanation of why it is going to work or why you make a change, you know, then you have to explain why you have to make a change. Okay? <clears throat> Find the result of something. Well, you said that it could be the result. Oh, well, I can give you a table like this and then ask you what is it going to do. 
So that means you have to reverse this entire process, okay? Because you are given this table already, so you have to reverse this entire process and then come up with this, and also the mnemonic and also the opcode corresponding to it. So in that case, you do need to explain of why you think we are dereferencing C. Well, I think we're dereferencing C because C, register C is coming out of register output one of the register bank. And then because of the multiplex, the demultiplexer, it is connected to the input of the multiplexer that eventually connects to the A point. So you have to go through that explanation to tell me why you think based on these values, register C is being dereferenced. Then you also have to tell me why you think the output of RAM is being used to update register A, okay? RI mux is configured in a certain way to make it happen. RI cell is you know, configured in a certain way to make it happen. So then you have to explain that, you know, the reasoning why you come to that conclusion. So then we should also print out the opcode table? Um, it would, that would be a great idea too. I would say, you know, print out the opcode table as well. I mean, you can bring anything that is printed on a piece of paper or handwritten. So, you know, how much is how much is one print out? I mean, it depends on whether you own a printer or not. If you own your own printer, you know, one print out is about what two, three cents or so, you know, including the paper and the toner. If you do not, then you need to use you know, one of our printers here. How much do it cost to print out one page, black and white? Hmm? Sorry. Ten cents. Okay, so it's not too bad. Okay, you know, you can kind of you know figure out you know, what you want to print out. <clears throat> All right, so that's question number two. Any other questions? I hope I addressed that question. Yep. Okay, so any other questions about number two or questions that ask you about the architecture of the processor? Okay, assuming there are no questions, we are going to move on to question number three, which I think is the last question. Yep, it is the last question. So this one has to do with the double precision floating point number format. And, you know, I, I gave, I'm giving you the equation already, okay, because this is how we compute the value represented by a bit pattern that is formatted in the IEEE double precision floating point number format. But you can bring your own too, okay? So if you like the Wikipedia page of, you know, representing and, you know, color coding the whole thing, well, print it out and bring it with you. If you don't want to print it out and you want to go like, okay, I can do it on a piece of paper using my own handwriting and coloring, do that too. That's less expensive because you don't have to pay the 10 cents per page. Okay, so this question is giving you the actual definition. It's giving you the bit pattern here. Think of a double precision floating point number as a base two scientific notation, blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> Express X in base two. You can use the dot, dot, dot notation as long as you indicate the actual number of a repeating digits. Okay, so what X are we talking about? X is the entire 64-bit pattern. Okay, so that's what the first part is asking. Explain step-by-step, step, starting with the bit pattern, what is the biased exponent of two in base 10? Explain step by step what is the actual comp exponent of two in base ten. Explain step by step, starting with the bit pattern. What is the binary mantissa? Okay, normalize the coefficient. So I'm even explaining to you what mantissa means. Okay, it is what we call a normalized the coefficient. Under the, answer this part with a binary number, and so on. Okay, so what this is really asking you is to say, how help me decode you know, the bit pattern X back into the value that it is representing. That's all it's asking, okay? Which means your question is is probably not gonna look like this, okay? It will still be testing whether you understand the double precision floating point number format, but the way it is asked, it, it's not gonna be the same because I don't usually ask the same kind of question in consecutive semesters. I try my best not to use, reuse any format at all. But sometimes, you know, after teaching this class for 20 years, it's getting difficult not to reuse a particular format. Okay, so let's start here. So for question number one, okay, the answer is just gonna be 0, 1, 0, 0. 
zero 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 zero. Then we have zero 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 one. Then we have uh, a C is a one one zero zero. <clears throat> a three is zero zero one one. An eight is one zero zero zero. And this is where we can just say dot dot dot. Okay, all the way to the end. Because there are going to be zeros. I don't want you to waste your time to write a whole bunch of zeros when you can just use a dot 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 notation. Okay, that's the first part. The first part you know, does not even say anything about explaining how you do this because it's a table lookup kind of thing. Okay, table lookup, you know, four is zero, one, zero, zero. Zero is zero, 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 zero. One is zero, 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 one, which means you probably want to have that table, you know, the lookup table too, between hexadecimal and also, you know, in base two. Some of you probably have already memorized, you know, that table. You don't have to bring it with you. If you have not memorized or if you feel like, well, I would rather have that table with me just in case, bring it with you, okay? You know, it doesn't ha even have to be printed out. You can just hand write it on a piece of paper along with other things that you think are important. Okay, so that's part A, uh, part one. So part two is asking step by step, explain starting with the big pattern, what is the biased exponent of two in base 10, okay? So I'm just gonna say, you know, um, the biased exponent is from this particular bit to this particular bit here. Okay, so <clears throat> which range of bits are we talking about here? Okay, so let's just say that, you know, I'm one of you and I totally forgot to study this entire thing. Do you think I can still answer this question? Yes. Because it's already spelled out, okay? This whole equation here is already telling you, oh, the bias, you know, exponent is from bit 52 to bit 62. It's already spelled out. You just have to know how to read this entire thing. Okay, so that's helpful. Okay. And as such, you know, we just have to look up, you know, which ones are bit 62 and which one is bit 52. <clears throat> I wouldn't count from this side, okay, because now you have to count what? 52, you know, it's a long way. I would start on this side. This is bit 63, this is bit 62. This is where we start, okay? 61, 60, blah, 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 blah. This is bit 52, okay? <clears throat> so I'm just going to say that would be... This portion here, the little label here, C label A, and then the answer, the question is asking what is the actual exponent, what is the bias of, ex, of ex, the, what is the bias exponent of two in base 10? So this is not answering the entire question, but it's a good starting point. So I just have to say one zero 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 one in base two, is 1024 plus one, which is 1025. That would be the answer, okay? 1025 is the biased exponent <clears throat> in base 10. Is that okay? So we move on to question number three, which says, explain step-by-step step what is the actual exponent of two in base 10. So we just say that the exponent in base two is the biased exponent minus 1,023. But Tech, you did not study for this exam. How can you tell that the biased amount is 1,023? I spelled it out as a part of the question. So read the question carefully because sometimes, not all the time, sometimes the question is giving you everything that you need to answer the question itself, okay? You just have to know what you're reading and make the connections. So in this case, it's gonna be 1,025, which is what I got from the previous part, minus 1,023, which is just a two. <clears throat> and then step four 
is asking, explain step by step, you know, starting with a bit pattern, what is the binary mantissa, okay? So I'm just going to do another block here, okay? And say this is block B. So I'm going to say block B is the fractional part of the mantissa. Once again, I ask the question, you know, I did not study. How do I know the, the, the part B is the fractional part of the mantissa? Because I spelled out the entire thing here. This is the part, this is the mantissa. And I know this is a valid mantissa. It is normalized because, you know, this entire part here cannot add up to one. It can add up to close to one, but not one. So it's one point something here, which is a valid uh, mantissa, you know, because it's a, it's a coefficient, it is less than two, it's greater than zero, so it counts as a mantissa. <clears throat> so that means you know, the mantissa is one point and then followed by part B, which is zero, zero, one, one, and then we have another one here, and then a bunch of zeros, there we go. In base two, okay, so I'm gonna emphasize this is in base two because I believe that's what the question is asking as well, is answer, answer this part with a binary number, okay? All right, so part five, express the mantissa as a sum of base 10 whole numbers and fractions, such as blah, blah, blah. This example is clearly wrong, but the format is correct, okay? So that means, you know, I just need to express it as, okay, so let me kind of scroll down here. So that means, you know, Part five is basically saying the mantissa is one plus, we don't have a half, we don't have a quarter, we have an eighth, we have a sixteenth, we have a thirty second, that's it, okay? That's what the part five is asking, okay? Um, because now it is expressed in base 10 as whole numbers, which is just the one, <clears throat> and fractions. And the fractions are all fractions of powers of four, uh, excuse me, power of two, because you know, that's how a binary number is interpreted. All right, so we are now down to part six, which is to compute the value as interpreted based on double precision floating point number um, as a base 10 you know, decimal number. Okay, so we now have to combine all of the other parts into one single answer. So we go to part six here, we go like, okay, so VD of X is going to be the mantissa, which is one plus one eighth plus one sixteenth plus one you know, of the 30 second times two to the power of two. So if you get to this part here, I'll give you a good portion of the, of the you know, partial credit already because you know, the rest is really just to finish this up. So <clears throat> there are many ways to do this. I can integrate the times four into the fraction itself. So now we have four plus four divided by eight plus four divided by 16 plus four divided by 32, which is uh, four plus one half plus one quarter plus one eighth <clears throat> which is uh, 4 plus 0.5 plus 0.25 plus 0.125, which eventually adds up to 4 point, what, uh, 825, I think? 875, sorry. Got it. 875, done. So, so are we good so far? <clears throat> I mean, this is one of the most direct way to ask about the double precision floating point number, your know, format, is really just to give you the bit pattern and then ask you what value is it representing. So you can kind of think about the alternative ways that I can ask about the same kind of knowledge, but in a different format. All righty, so that covers the entire um, exam two from spring 2023, do we have any questions? So is the scope kind of clear, you know, what range of topics is going to be included 
in exam two. Yep. Uh, for the processor architecture questions, mm -hmm. uh, would, uh, wouldn't it be expected to know all the opcodes within the one and add to the others? Well, let's take a look at the ones that we have covered, okay? The, the, the families of opcodes that we have covered, okay? So for this particular question, we have covered at least no op, alt, right? Because you know, those two are you know, in your questions already. Uh, we have talked about the arithmetic type of instructions. So that's gonna be not, and, or, add, subtract. <clears throat> we have also talked about your know, compare. And right shift is one of those things too, you know, even though you know, it goes through a right shifter, okay, but it's inside the ALU, we have talked about those. Um, we talked about the flags, okay? So the flags would be the C, Z, sign, overflow, and the L flag, okay? We talked about those. <clears throat> In terms of jump instructions, we have talked about JMPI, JCI, JZI, JSI, JOI, and then JLI. They belong to the same family, okay? Once I explain one, the other ones is like, okay, kind of the same thing with a minor twist. Um, we talked about memory-related instructions. So that would be LDI, LD, ST. So those instructions we have talked about as well. So as far as I can tell, you know, these are the ones that we have talked about so far. Now, that's not the entire you know, list of all the opcodes because we haven't talked about JMP without the I. Uh, we have not talked about JC without the I and so on, but I think that's about a fair representation of what we have talked about in terms of the architecture of the processor. Is that okay? So the question is, how are you going to study for this exam? I don't have a lab here for today, so I can kind of burn the lab time a little bit to talk about how to kind of prepare and study for the exam. So how would you prepare for this exam? Yep. Mm -hmm. But you can, but when you're studying, you can use Logisim. Logisim is a great tool for studying. You cannot use it in the exam, but you can use it when you're going like, okay, I'm not really quite sure how compare works. Okay, we talked about in class, but you know, you go like, okay, but I really kind of don't understand certain portions of it. Okay, if I say compare A to C, how does register A and register C get routed to the ALU, okay? And how do we know that, you know, the difference, which is a, the, the result of the subtraction, is not being used to update the registers you know, in the register bank? So let's say that's your question. So what do you do? You go through the same steps that I go through in class. You hand assemble or use the assembler to help you assemble the op, the opcode. You put it into RAM, you kind of fast forward until you get past decode, and then you examine the pathways you know, established between the components in the processor. And then in the whole process, you leave no stone unturned. You look at every single multiplexer, you look at every single demultiplexer, and you understand, oh, so this switch is pointing this way and that switch is pointing the other way it's until you understand exactly how register A gets routed to in one of the ALU, how register C gets routed to in two of the ALU, how the ALU route the input ports through the sub subtractor, and how the result of the subtraction is used to update the five flags that we have talked about, and so on. So basically, it is a matter of going through the processes that we have already talked about in class, but you have to go through it because when you listen to me explain it, it's one thing, your mind you know, is absorbing the material, but only up to a certain extent. There are many occasions where people say, when I listen to you explain it, I think I fully understand it, but when it's time for me to do it, <clears throat> it gets a little bit more difficult. So that's why you have to go through the process yourself because it is involving a different portion of your brain as you're doing it yourself, when you're trying to ex you know, explain to yourself how things you know, happen. Uh, the conditional branch instructions, you know, the JCI, JZI, JSI, JOI, and JLI, those can be a little bit tricky as well, okay? So I would say <clears throat> you might need to kind of review and make sure that you understand 
how conditional jump you know, can happen. Okay, you know, what is the one mechanism that let us you know, choose how to update the program counter depending on one of the bits of the flags register. Okay, so that is one of those things you know, that you kind of have to go back and revisit, okay, because when I talked about it in class, I'm pretty sure most of you are thinking, yeah, we get it. But you know, when you do it yourself, you know, that will give you a different you know, understanding. Um, the LDI, LDST instructions, they all have to do with, with memory. You know, how we get a location in RAM to update one of the registers with LDI and LD. And the ST goes the opposite direction. We use one of the registers to update the content at a location of RAM that re a register is pointing to. Okay, so it's good to go through all three of these instructions just to figure out how they work. Um, these, uh, these are really just one single family of instructions because they all go through the ALU, just you know, different components in the ALU to perform different operations. So I would look at most of these as one kind of single thing, except for compare, which is the same thing as a subtract, but it doesn't give you the result back. It doesn't store the result back into one of the registers. Um, and then these indi individual flags you know, can be important as well. Okay, because what does it mean when the overflow flag is a one? Well, you kind of have to remember that from the discussion of binary comparison. So that means the implicit range of the topics extends a little bit out of what I just talked about because we talked about binary representation, signed, unsigned, you know, that sort of stuff. They all have, they are all related to the flags. So that means, you know, you also need to kind of go back to revisit some of those topics. <clears throat> so I would say binary addition, binary subtraction, binary comparison, and signed versus unsigned representation, those four modules would still be useful to prepare for this exam. Yep? Oh, sorry, I'm not muted. Oh, then you want to kind of look into that, right? You know, why do they not change the flag? They, they, they seem to be doing the same thing as adding one to a register, but it doesn't change the flag. So why is that? What is the mechanism that make it so that it does not update the flag's register? Hmm? No, it has to do with the architecture. So I can show you in the diagram. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, not this one. We want to go back to the processor one, which is this one here. Okay, so this is the right diagram. This is the flags register, and this is the enable pin of the flags register. So you can see that it is connected to a to its, to its own equation. So if you look at the enable pin, it goes all the way up here. Well, that's not a... Oh, it goes to FC. So FC itself is a tunnel here. So this is the reason why um, it does not update. It has to do with, you know, this is the NAND between ALU enable and R register output one demux. So now you have to say, okay, so what, what does register output one demux have anything to do with, you know, the um, FC, you know, tunnel? Well, if you're looking up at increment, does increment use one register or two registers? We know add is using two registers, right? It's adding the second register to, to the first one. What about increment? How many registers do you specify when you say increment? Just one single register. So that means out of the register bank, okay, only one of the output is in use. Register output one is not in use. Okay, so if register output one is not used, then I can use the DMUX corresponding to register output one to do something else. In this case, I use it to indicate whether the flags register should be updated or not. Because when the ALU is enabled, that means you know, this input pin is gonna be a one, right? And this is a NAND gate. If this is a NAND gate, if, at, if one input is a one, you still cannot know what the output is because you need both inputs to be a one to get a zero out. So if I make register output one demux to be a zero, 
Then we have 0 NAND 1, which means the output is still going to be a 1, in which case we update the, the, the flex register. However, if I use 1 also for register output 1 DMUX, which does not make sense because you know, if you look at register output 1 DMUX, which is this one here, if it is a 1, then we have, okay, let me see. So FC is, oh, FC is negated here before it goes into the flex register. So you have to look at the configuration when you're about to execute the increment instruction, then it will be clear why it does not update the flex register. The other mystery of the increment instruction is how do we know we're supposed to add one? Because it doesn't have a second register to say, oh, this is the other register, it has a value of one, so when you add the two registers, we're incrementing by one. So the question is, where is that one coming from? <clears throat> In the circuit diagram, it is actually quite clear. We have a constant of one here. This multiplexer is choosing between are we using the second register you know, to go to into of the ALU, or are we just using a constant to go to into of the ALU? So that, so you have to trace that, you have to track it down. Okay, so that's how you kind of study for the architecture part, is you really kind of need to know, you know, how things are configured and connected depending on what you want it to do. Okay, uh, there's no shortcut, okay, you know, other than really kind of going through the exercise of tracking through the operation of each uh, instruction. You don't have to do it for every single possible one, but you do have to do it like, you know, for the major ones, you know, that are different. Okay, what about um, the first question? How do you prepare for the first question? So let me go back to this thing here. So this is the one that I did not record, but I also think that, well, you may not need that recording because you know, this is, in terms of the process, it's really rather simple, okay? You, know, you really have to just understand what is NC representing? What is PD representing? Then you have to understand the basic devices that we have talked about in this class. The AND gate, the NAND gate, the OR gate, the NOR gate, and then the SR latches, okay? So those are all the basic devices that we have talked about in this class. Do you know the truth table of all of those devices? Okay, so I have just mentioned something that you might want to put on your sheets, okay, that you're gonna to bring to the class. The truth tables of all the your common your devices that we have talked about and used in this class, okay? Um, so other than that, you know, this is you know, really the same thing as the homework, I mean, not the homework assignment, but the lab. So I'm gonna go back to, <clears throat> Canvas, and to make sure that you can redo that particular lab in practice stuff, you know, so if you go into practice stuff, you can go back to, you know, some of these. Okay, so I, there are a few I forgot to enable here. So once I enable these, you can redo this, you know, but, with, but it, it won't change your grade, okay? It's not going to change your grade, but you can go through these as many times as you want to. So that means um, the, the PD one should be here as well. Yep, so the NC and PD, the practice one, you can just redo that one. Because you know, the, the, the lab is not just having you to do something, it includes the instruction of how to do it. So that means you know, revisiting these labs can be beneficial because it contains instructions as well as the actual activity itself. All right, what about the double precision floating point number kind of question? How do you prepare to answer those questions? Okay, so let me go all the way to <clears throat> this question here. How do you prepare to answer these questions? First thing first, you have to, you have to understand this particular definition. What is, how do we compute the value being represented by the 64 bits in a double precision floating point number, okay? Because everything comes from that definition, okay? Now, one thing is, you know, you may want to include the entire definition, 
in the things that you bring to the exam. Because what if I don't give you that to begin with? Because you're supposed to know that already, okay? So you might want to go like, okay, I don't want to rely on tech including things that I'm supposed to know already. Instead, I'm just going to write it down on my piece of paper and bring it with me. Is that okay? All right. So the question is, are we understanding this particular definition? So that's a question I cannot answer for you, okay? Because you know, that's something that you have to kind of figure out you know, by yourself and go like, okay, do I understand the notations? Do I understand you know, which part is which part? And the best way to do this is to give yourself an example, like you know, this question here, give, give yourself a bit pattern and try to figure it out. So that's how I would you know, kind of prepare for the exam. I am not, okay, one thing I'm not going to do is to redo these questions over and over again until I can regurgitate the proper answer to these questions. That is what I would call over preparing for the exam. Because by doing that, I'm spending all this time to memorize a specific answer to a specific way of asking the questions. Then I'm no longer open to other ways you know, other ways of asking these questions. I may not be focusing on understanding the topics. My mind is focusing on just the processes, the, the, the very specific steps to answer these specific questions, which is not going to be useful in my kind of exams. So your focus is understanding the concepts to the point where you can say, I don't care how the question is asked. I know enough about the subject matter that I can problem solve and figure out the answer no matter how the question is asked. That would be the objective. Yep? So would like a change in format be like, say, instead of base 2, you say like base 7? No, no you know, for this one, I'm not going to you know, switch the base, but I can change it so that it is the reverse. I give you the value being represented, and you figure out the bit pattern. That's one way to do it, right? <clears throat> there are many other ways to do it, you know, but, you know, it, it's still ultimately you know, be, you know, testing whether you understand that this is how we figure out the value of a bit pattern. But I can switch the direction. I can say, okay, this is the value I want to represent. Okay, I can give you an example. Some of you can work on this you know, as your exercise. So I can say, I want to represent you know, negative 17.625. Okay? What is the bit pattern? How do I figure out the 64 bits? of the double precision floating point number to represent the value that I just specified, which I cannot even remember anymore. I think it's seven, negative 17.625. So in that case, you reverse the process, okay? You start with the value being represented, then you have to go like, okay, so what is the next step? We went through that in class, okay? We actually went through that in class, so you have to kind of revisit you know, what we did in class to kind of get that done. Um, Another format you know, can be related to the positive and the negative exponent homework assignment. You know, I can give you a particular you know, value, and then, I'm at, then I can ask you, you know, about, okay, if I were to apply this logic to this particular you know, value, you know, the, uh, the mantissa or the coefficient, uh, exponent of 2 and exponent of 10, if I were to do this process like twice or three times, What's going to happen to these you know, respective value? So I'm not going to give you know, give you something like, oh, you know, after you know, like 200 iterations, what's going to be the result? You know, but I can say after five iterations, five times you're going through this loop, what's going to happen? Or maybe three times through the loop, what's going to happen? So I can ask you, you know, those your know, questions. They still relate to double precision floating point number because ultimately we are just dealing with some kind of coefficient times 2 to the power of something times 10 to the power of something. That's the whole conversion process. So does that answer the question? Okay, excellent. Okay, so anything else? It's open book, open notes, no electronics. You can bring a graphic, you know, um, graphical you know, calculator with you, but then everything else you know, is going to be on paper. Okay, all right, and you guys know where to find the lecture recordings.
Now the nice thing is you know, we have two sections of this class. We have the Monday, Wednesday class and the Tuesday, Thursday class, which you're in, which you're in. So that means if I forget to record something, you can check out the Monday, Wednesday class. So that applies to this exam too, okay? You know, the, because I forgot to turn on the recorder today, so I did not record the answer to the first question. But I'm gonna go, I will do this again tomorrow for the Monday, Wednesday class. So assuming <laughs> that I'm not forgetting tomorrow, you can check out the recording for the Monday, Wednesday class tomorrow just to get the recording of the answer to the, to, to the first question. It's not gonna be the same question as the one that you answer, same format, same circuit, but different you know, states for the input, which is even better because you know, now you have the exposure of this answer for your you know, sample question, and then you have a different one from the Monday, Wednesday class. So you know, just kind of check out the recording tomorrow, then you can get back you know, to the uh, recording of the question to the first question. Do you have videos from like last semester or not? Oh, I have recordings tracing all the way back at least 10 years, every semester, including summer sessions. So yes, you can, you can, you can actually watch a lot of the re recordings. <clears throat> All right, so to kind of further, you know, handle that, you know, uh, handle that question, so you just go to YouTube, youtube.com, some profs, and you just have to find a specific date, you know, go to videos, and, you know, you can, you can trace the way all the way back to, uh, you know, at least 10 years. Hmm? Sorry? Oldest. Yep, 2010. So you can track it all the way back to 2010. I'm not sure whether that's going to be helpful or not, because you know, in 2010, I think the TTP is not quite finished yet. Okay, so you know, it's, it may not be as helpful. Um, but I would say anything from the previous semester and the one before the semester, like fall 2022, may be helpful. You know, but that's a lot of stuff to go through. Um, oh, I got to show you this trick here that may be helpful. And you can also see how the, all of these are only 10, minute long, 10 minutes long because that's before my account was uh, eligible to upload the longer content. So for one single lecture, I have to chop it up into smaller parts, which is tedious. Okay, so let me show you one trick that can be helpful you know, for some people, may not be helpful to you know, some other people, but you know, I'm just you know, showing you a trick here. So you go to a video, and I can show you in a incognito window or private window here, because you know, once I sign in, you, know, you guys may think, oh, you can do it only because you're the con. Okay, so now we switch to the incognito or private window. So now I'm not signed in at all, you know, because it doesn't keep that. All right, so the one thing I want to show you is going, okay, I have to remember where, you know, how to navigate to that. You can download the uh, closed captions. So I go here, nope. How do I do that? Nope. All right, closed captioning yeah. options. Huh. Do you remember? Does anyone know how to get to you know just download the closed captioning as a text file? Yeah, but I thought you know, you can do it through you know just directly through uh, YouTube as well. But apparently, it doesn't give me that interface here. There we go. Okay, thank you. So you can go to show transcripts, and you can probably download the entire thing. Hmm. There's no download link here. Okay, but this is still helpful, yeah, you know, because you know you can toggle timestamp. Okay, if I turn off timestamp, it's just a text thing. Can you download it? Do you know? 
Okay. Um, you know, but as you said, you know, there are other resources online that can help you download the entire transcript. Why do you want to do that with the timestamp? Because you can search. So instead of listening through the whole thing because you're looking for a specific thing, you just download the entire transcript with the timestamp, use a search tool, okay? You know, just notepad and search in text, okay? Look for a particular term or phrase or something like that, and then you can quickly locate you know, the timestamp, then you go back into the video. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it would search through the, the scrolling list here, okay? So with this one, we can just control F, you know, which has a you know, search here. So let's just look for scope. Okay. So can does it go through the entire thing? Let's see. It found only three matches. So it's whatever is being displayed. So let me look for something that scrolled off the screen. And then we look for the word understand. Oh, okay. It does go through the entire list. All right. So that's a great tool. And if you were to use this tool, I would definitely turn the timestamp back on. So now you know what the what time in the video itself did I mention something like that. So I think for studying, you know, this is a tool, okay? Not you know, it it helps, okay? Because it helps to quickly locate a particular topic. And I have to say, you know, YouTube, in terms of the transcription, it does a really good job. Occasionally it will get something wrong, but it is really, really accurate, okay? Um, which is surprising to me because I do speak with a certain accent and it seems to be able to you know, recognize what I meant to say even with all that accent. So it's a, it's a great tool. It's, it's just, it's a great tool. Oh, really? Oh, okay, but it has to associate your account, not my account, with the videos. So it tracks what you're watching. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Because I don't have the you know, monetization turned on. You know, you guys might have noticed. You don't have to wait five seconds you know, for a commercial to, to get through, you know, to get to my content. You just click there and it's already there. Because I do not turn on the monetization you know, option. All right. Any other questions about you know getting ready for the exam? Yes. Um, how far back do you like to be like on the passage? Kind of thing? So like, technically speaking, time? we are starting with the double precision floating point number format. That would be the beginning of the scope of this exam. However, because the processor has you know the flags, so if you go to the ALU of the processor. It has the C, Z, S, O, L, you know, flags. So the meaning of those flags, you know, when it becomes one and when it becomes a zero, those tie into binary subtraction, binary comparison, signed versus unsigned interpretation. So those topics can still be useful. Um, and then in the double precision floating point number question, you know, you still need to understand how to, um, uh, how to, convert between base 10 and base 2. So that's going all the way back to base conversion. So that means you know you still need to understand some of the topics that we have talked about so far, even though technically speaking, the scope of the exam is from double precision floating point number all the way to the discussion of the architecture of the processor. Not sure whether that's answering your question because it's a little vague because you know there's a little bit dependency, a little bit of dependency on things that we have learned already. Okay, any other questions? All right, so I always space out you know the discussion of the exam from a previous semester and the actual exam by one week because that way we have one more class meeting before the exam. So namely, in our case, it's our Thursday class. So that means if you try to study as much as you can and you come up with some questions, it's like, okay, you know, I'm reviewing the content, the material, but I'm a little stuck here, not quite sure, you know, how this, what this means or how to interpret that, then you can bring those questions up on Thursday in class so that we can talk about it. I have office hours, okay, you know, from so today's office hour is before the class, so it's over already. 
but I have office hours, you know, continuing to have on it, to have it on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday, and right before the class on Tuesday. So there are office hours that you can utilize to ask me questions. So we got all of these extra resources available. Okay, it's up to you to utilize the resources. Any questions? Any other questions? All right, so if there are no extra questions, I'm going to stop the recorder, even though this is not a full recording. It does start 